that the petroleum engineering student made us proud and came out one of the best first position, one of the best in Africa in that competition. So please make this. And that's because we also have very respected and very competent university lecturers. And that's what we want to hear now from our brother, Professor Allen. It's today I'm hearing uh, the other name as Baodumonsi. I got it right. Uh, I got it. Oh, is this a bit different? He has said everything there now. <laughs> you know, this is the, everything he says, nobody questioning. Everything he says. That's the beauty of the inaugural lecture. But we are taking this to the next step. To the next step. After this, we have registered. I think we have tidied up everything. Maybe by next one or the other one that we will decorate in this place. All those people who have presented a Nobel lecture in this university here. We will hand over to them medal. A medallion and then even a, a kind of a, what do you call that? A plaque. You will have the registrar and the VC signature there. In just at that plan. To differentiate it from other places. Because we want to do things uniquely that people, other universities will be learning from us and will follow us. That is the goal. And so, after the next, maybe we match, after the match, the inaugural lecture, by April, we will have that ceremony here. And so, and for a woman who is here, will also be decorated. So you must avail yourself. Don't be there. <laughs> Everybody. We will not be calling Allen, Professor Allen. We shall be calling him Blues. <laughs> We, that is it. We call them like the man you see there. We call him Barack Boy. <laughs> Barack Boy to the title of your inaugural lecture. While this man sitting, we always call him Sumption. <laughs> Sumption. And that is what we have been doing. And then uh, Professor Ibaba will call him Licky Roof. <laughs> Licky Roof. So we are we are presented so many. Then uh, uh, Jeremiah will call him Oracle. Oracle in the blood. And then we start to be calling the numbers. So what's your number? What's your number? Like now we now call it this number is 34. That's why we are pleading with every professor who is here to avail yourself for this kind of honor. I will say that I want to let you know that your stay in this place will be exciting and you will learn something. You will not go empty. You came in empty, but you go out what? Full. You will get something. Thank you very much. At this point in time, let me very specially invite the University Orator, Father Saprobi, to come and take the citation on the inaugural lecturer. Professor Allen, as it will the most, I citation. Professor Allen Aki was born on the 22nd of August 1967 in Otuabla II to the family of late Chief Ikoruma and Chief Ikoruma and Mrs. Delfina E. Aki of Otuabla II in Okoya local government area of Bayelsa State. He began his primary school education in 1973 at St. Barnabas School, Tor Brass. 
and completed in 1979 at St. James Primary School, Otuabula II. In 1981, he entered government secondary school, Okbea Town, to start his secondary school education. And in 1988, he took the West African School Certificate at Community Secondary School, Akukumama, Okoruma, Okoruma in Mimbe local government area of Biosystem. In 1990, Professor Agi was admitted to study for the National Certificate of Education in the River State College of Education, now Ignatius Ajuru University in rural Lomini in Obia, or local government areas of River State. He graduated at the top of his class and was awarded the princely sum of 100 naira. <laughs> as the best graduate student of his faculty. Following the brilliant performance at the NCE, he entered the University of Nepal in the same year, in 1994. And two years later, he received the Bachelor of Education degree political science, taking a second class upper in 1995. He was called to Kaduna State for his national youth service in 1996. Motivated by a yearning for research career, Professor Alan Agi entered the University of Putrakot to study for the master's degree in educational management. He completed in 2000, and in 2002 he returned to continue his doctoral research. And 2009, following the submission and successful defense, of his dissertation titled Readiness of Urban and Rural Schools for the Implementation of the Universal Basic Education in Biosystem State, Professor Agi was awarded the Doctor of Philosophy degree in Educational Management. Professor Okay. Professor Agi entered the services of the Niger Delta University in 2002 as assistant lecturer to commence his academic career. He rose steadily through the ranks and was promoted to lecturer, th lecturer 1 in 2007, senior lecturer 2011, associate professor in 2014, and in October 2017, Professor Agi received promotion to the full rank of Professor of Educational Management and become the first <laughs> the first to do so in the National High University. Professor Agi is an engaged scholar who has published extensively in both local and international, internationally reputed journal. He has held several positions both within and outside the university system. From 2012 to 2013, he was acting head of the Department of Educational Foundation, Nagarantha University. From 2013 to date, he serves as a director Directorate of Advancement and Linkages, Niger, Del Niger Delta University. In this position, he has contributed to the growth and advancement of the university by establishing linkages for research and academic advancement between Niger Delta University and other institutions, such as Vial University of Technology in South Africa, University of Wolverhampton in the United Kingdom, and Bradford. University also in the United Kingdom. He has served on several committees including Faculty of Education Disciplinary Committee, 
Secretary, Department of Educational Foundation. And in 2010, he served as Secretary, Local Organizing Committee for the hosting of the Nigerian Academy of Education Annual Congress, Niger Delta University. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you a young and energetic academic, a scholar who has written extensively on the importance of quality and efficiency in educational system, a seasoned administrator, former head, Department of Educational Foundation, current director, Directorate of Advancement and Linkages, and now Professor of Educational Management, Professor Allen and the Dumosi I said good afternoon everyone. Is the afternoon not good? Alright, so please respond. So, I have an object in my hands. You can see it. It's just an empty carton that is quite light, as a matter of fact. You can see. You can see what I have in my hands. Okay, thank you. Something, a force, will be responsible for the object I have in my hands to fall to the ground. Just take a look. Just like this. Do you know what that is? Yes, gravity. Thank you. That is the force of gravity. But who has ever seen gravity? Have you ever seen gravity in your life? But gravity is one of the most profound forces in the whole world. But you can't see it. You can't even touch it. It is the same with electricity. You feel it, you enjoy it, but you can't see it. It's similar with the air you breathe. It's blowing around you and that is actually what makes you to be alive. But you don't see it. Perhaps your thoughts, your thinking is another powerful force. And so the world that we live in is governed by laws. Laws govern this world. And the world is not governed by chance. I may have to repeat what I've just said. The universe, the activities, all the processes of the world are governed by laws. If you are able to work with these laws, you will prosper. But if you fail to work with these laws, you will definitely pay the consequences. In the same way, what we do as teachers in the classroom is governed by law, not by chance. You don't teach by chance. And so today, we shall be talking about one of the laws, one of the greatest laws that governs what we do in the classroom. And we'll call that Bloom's Taxonomy. And so here we go. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, the Echo General of our time. Thank you, sir. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is with a heart full of joy and gratitude that I stand before you today to present this inaugural lecture. This is a real privilege given to me to present the 34th inaugural lecture in our great university, the Niger Delta University. And I want to thank the Vice Chancellor for giving me this great opportunity. Thank you, sir. This inaugural lecture is actually the very first in educational management in this university. My inspiration 
this lecture is actually inspired by two great personalities. I actually met one in 1925. Wow, yeah, you're saying wow. I was not born in 1925. But happily, I was able to get in touch with this personality through my world of books. Don't worry, you will get to meet this personality in a very short while. The other personality was a, a bit recent, in 1992. So welcome to the first personality. I'm sure you are familiar with this fellow. That is the great Gandhi of uh, India. So I would like to begin this lecture with an opening epigram from what Gandhi said in 1925. That's more than 90 years ago. All right. And it appears what he said at that time is still relevant in our world today. Gandhi identified seven deadly sins in the world at that time. Gandhi said, words without work is sinful. Do you agree with that? Does it make sense to us in our country, Nigeria? The second thing he said was, pleasure without conscience. Is it ringing something in your ears? The third is science without humanity. And then the fourth one is actually painted red because that applies to us in the school system. Gandhi said knowledge without character is a sin for us teachers. Those that are involved in the act of teaching and learning and whatever has to do with the school system. He went further to also say that politics, plain politics without principle is also sinful. And perhaps I should have painted that one also red. You know what is happening in our society. Politics must be played by the rules. Then he also said that commerce without morality is also a sin. And lastly, Gandhi said, worship without sacrifice is equally sinful. Now, these problems still exist in the world today. Happily, there are some countries that have taken responsibility and they have made progress. I would want us to think about what Gandhi has said. Now, this is the second personality I met. Some of you may know this fellow. We call him Asuru. He's now a professor at the uh, former River State College of Education. So I met Professor at uh, COE then in 1992. He was my teacher and uh, I met him in a kind of a dramatic circumstance that uh, has impacted greatly in my life. Well, the story is that I never wanted to be a teacher, but whoever wants to be a teacher, nobody. And so my original idea was to uh, read law and so when I could not succeed, I had to take the last option of uh, going to uh, be a teacher, but now I love it. <laughs> and so, in my first class, I met this great man. I went to school quite very late, so they had already started. And when I got to the class, Arthur was already teaching, and the topic for the day was measurement and evaluation. And they were talking about broom and taxonomy, and he mentioned something, non-cognitive domain. And I said, frankly, this is not where I want to be. <laughs> Nothing was making sense to me at all. But I could see that other colleagues of mine were responding quite very well. I said, if I continue, then I may be disgraced out. So I already made up my mind to defer my admission. So, after we gave an assignment, and the title was for us to talk about the imperatives of the non-cognitive domain. <laughs> I have not heard of Bloom before. I have not heard of taxonomy. That we should go and do an assignment on non-cognitive domain and bring it the next day. As, and I said I was going to stop my school at that point. 
So as I was lamenting my words, a fellow student came to me. He said, uh, uh, how are you going to do your assignment? I said, I don't know. Actually, I'm just reporting for the second year after being away for quite some time. He said, let's go to the library. I said, what can we get there? He said, there is a book called Encyclopedia Americana. <laughs> that if we get there, there is no knowledge I cannot get there. I said, let's try and see. So we got to the library and uh, we met the library, the library, the person in charge. And the lady brought a very big book. It's called Encyclopedia Americana. The library, I don't know whether we still have those in our library. Do students still come to read them? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the book is actually so big. It's about four volumes of the Bible. So how do you now access this kind of information for the top of war? Then we were able to trace some areas and the issue of how to get information. And there were no photocopiers so close by. There were no snap uh, 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 phone to snap. This is you guys snap and they record our lecture so it's quite so easy. The man said you have to copy. He said you have to you really have to write. He said yes, so we have to copy everything. And we were able to submit the assignment in about two days time. On Friday the 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 feedback came. So after we said uh, some people won't try it, but uh, the try was not good enough. So it is he uh, shared us our scripts and said who got ten over ten? Nobody stood up. <laughs> Who got nine over ten? Nobody stood up. <laughs> Who got eight over ten? I thought maybe others will stand before me because I got eight over ten. So I did not stand eight stood up and looked back. It appeared that there was no other person. <laughs> <laughs> there was no other I said, who got seven over ten? Nobody. Six over ten? Nobody. Five over ten? Nobody. Four over ten? Nobody. Until four over ten, then about three other students stood up. So, I said, how come that I don't even know what you are talking about? I'm not very significant to man. He said, ah, but you are not using in this class. He just said, so how come you are able to do this? Please, keep up. I speak up. I like what you did. And that changed my school. <laughs> for the entire class and that I should keep the change. 50 naira was plenty money at that time. So I was able to buy cocos for my friends. <laughs> <laughs> then something else happened. The next day when I school came, people still were complaining that the issue of non-cognitive and this and that, that is quite very complex that the can't really understand. And he made another remarkable response that I need to mention. He said, why not discuss this issue with Aggie? <laughs> so from that day, I became the teacher of the class. <laughs> <laughs> so I was always scared going to school because it means I have to be accosted with students. Please come and explain this to me. And that was a great lesson, which means before I go to school, I must be prepared. Let me stop the story here. So, the non cognitive domain is the other name for the affective domain. But don't bother about it. I am going to simplify it. And just like my DC says, you are going to go back home different from as you came here. This concept now drives my research interest. It is therefore this wonderful story. So, it's actually a law that we are trying to teach you. And I want to so welcome to Benjamin Samuel Bloom. This is the 
the original author of what we've been talking about. Interestingly, Bloom's middle name is Samuel, and you know there's a Samuel in the house. Yeah. <laughs> it appears that Samuel is a great guy. So, there is a brief biography of uh, Bloom. I don't need to bother about that. Please pick your copy of the lecture and you can read it up. Some highlights from what Bloom says about uh, what we want to learn today. The first point is for us to know that Bloom was an American psychologist. He did a different thing. And what he did was that he defended the learning objectives in the theory. We call them cognitive domain, affective domain, and the psychological domain. These were the names that got me scared when I just started school. But you are going to get to understand this in a very short while. Bloom said that as we teach, as teachers in the school, that we must address these three components all at the same time to form what we now call whole person learning to be able to develop the total child. Otherwise, you are doing only part of it. He also mentioned that learning, as a matter of fact, and for whatever thing you do, must develop from the simple to the complex, from the known to the unknown, and that it must be categorized and linked like a taxonomy. Another significant discovery, and I, I need to read this for us to follow. Bloom realized through his research that any experiences within the family and their class setting that inculcates positive self esteem in children are the most significant in providing a good foundation for learning. Let us take note. This is because the person's actions, what you do, your feelings, your behaviors, and even your abilities are consistent with your self image and so your self-confidence. All Bloom is trying to say is that we should try to encourage our children. What Ashwood did to me at that time was just mere encouragement. And so he motivated me. And I stayed to If the remarks he made were negative, I don't know whether I would have continued. So I was left to respond to our children, our students, positively. There is a connection between bad action and every other activity. And in so many countries, I'll just move there. Israel is one of them, India, and the United States of America. If you go to these countries, what makes their country to have a very robust entrance system is because of Bloom. And so Bloom is considered the world guru of education. Bloom finished his work on art in 1999 and he died at the age of 86 years. Now to the concept of taxonomy. Remember the title, Bloom's Taxonomy Revisited. So we now know who Bloom is, right? All right. But I can't really say all. Today just a tip of the iceberg, read the material and others. And uh, I'm sure you get some more insight. So the concept taxonomy is just a Greek word, which means arrangement of things, classifying them in others. As a matter of fact, the way we are seated here in this hall is a taxonomy. My visitor, this is a taxonomy. <laughs> the order we process in here is a taxonomy. Somebody was leading, followed by a category of people, then another said, Mind you, you saw us moving, not any and anyhow. We were ordered. Then coming from the rear was the chief executive. That is a taxonomy. The biologist, you know this much more than me. Yeah, that is the real beginning of it. So all you are seeing, they are, they are all taxonomy. They are all linked together and so, a country called Nigeria, it's a taxonomy, made up of 36 states from the federal capital uh, territory. We are all linked together. And that's why whenever there is a problem in one area, it tends to affect every other state. My other state is a taxonomy made up of eight local governments. If you remove one, there is no bias state. And so we synchronize, we integrate, we work together. 
And indeed, the Niger Delta University is a taxonomy made up of faculties, departments, units, staff, students. Without any of this, there is no university. So everything in the world is a, a taxonomy. But I may have to go for that. What we are seeing here is the ecosystem. The geographers you know it far more than me, but that is a good example of what we mean by taxonomy. So it's not something that you need to crack your brain. It's what we do and what we are. This is a taxonomy. That is the solar system. You see all the different uh, planets? There are galaxies, they are arranged in order, and something like that. The one from there, the solar system ceases to exist. So indeed, everything in the world is a taxonomy. Even for us human beings. Somebody said that we are one, with different things that are trying to pay attention to this natural law. God designed his world, his world in an